Luke chapter 12 is where I'd like to look, kind of a new addition to what I planned. Uh, but let's look at Luke chapter 12, verse 15. I think there's no other way to set it up, the topic tonight, than looking here. It's a good way to set it up. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. This is our Godly Home series, right? We're talking about how to run your home, how to raise children, how to interact with your spouse, right? How to live for the Lord. <clears throat> One lesson we want to teach to our kids very plainly is that the life, uh, your life does not consist around that dollar bill, right? But if a kid growing up in America watched how America lives, they might get mighty confused, don't you think? It's like seems like everything revolves around the dollar, right? People chase their whole uh, academics and their whole careers trying to get more of those dollars. The government, all you want from the government is more dollars. Stock markets, uh, everyone's talking about that. Dollars, 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 and things, things, things. We need somehow to teach our kids that that is not your life. Yeah. And I think to have that message come through, I think it's harder in our age, 2021, than it might have been in 1721. But today it's everywhere. You need money. You need a lot of it. We're going to come back to this chapter but I want to go look at 15 and then look at the conclusion here, and then we'll come back later on and read the whole thing. But 34 tells us, look at verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's Luke 12, verse 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What are we telling our families? What are we telling our neighbors? What are we telling um, all those around us? about our treasure, right? Do people know that our treasure is opening God's word together? Our treasure is singing praise to God? Our treasure is sharing the gospel? Or does our treasure, from the world's point of view, look the same as their treasure, right? How much in the bank account, the wallet, what can you buy, what's on your, um, in your parking uh, lot, in your driveway, excuse me? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So tonight is twofold. Where is your treasure in your own life? And then uh, what do you portray to the world by how you live? Let's look at this. We're going to talk about a topic tonight that I've never covered. But let's, look, let's go over here to Acts chapter 4. Acts 4. I say I never covered it. I should rephrase that as I've never preached a whole sermon on this topic before. The topic is giving. I've touched on it in different lessons, but I've never preached a full sermon on it because for one reason, I grew up in the same era as you all as seen so many televangelists with the number at the bottom of the screen and you, you, know, you send in the money to the number on the screen and it's going to come back on the waters for you. It's going to change your life. Acts chapter 4. I've seen so many con men, like you've seen con men, who are making a killing at this thing called the false gospel, right? Ear tickling, and they're getting rich. So uh, pray for me. I've always said, well, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to look like them. But at the same time, I also wanted to make sure that our church knows and we know that our treasure is not in this earth. And so to give up things of this earth really isn't a big deal. Christians are to be givers, and let me do a few disclaimers. You know the reason I think God's having me preach this message too? Because I believe it to be true, and I think I am so naive. I think it's because I was raised in church and giving was always a thing. But I realize that for some people, the topic of giving is completely, it makes you shudder. I understand. It still scares me some too. But for some people who weren't raised in church, I think it completely scares them. If I join this church, am I gonna, what am I going to have to do? What do, I gotta, what do I give, right? How much do I got to give? Makes you scared. I understand. We're going to talk about it tonight. But just for a disclaimer, I want you to know that uh, um, I think giving is biblical. Uh, but this year, we don't do automatic deposits, okay? We don't pull out your paycheck. <laughs> a lot of church, churches do that. You know that? 
Um, we don't do tracking here. We don't track how much is one person giving, how much is another person giving. So just, just relax. Giving is between you and God. It is between you and God. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. I think God gives us some principles about it, but don't, don't worry about it. You're not going to find in me as a pastor someone who's going to nail you down on the pennies that you're giving. Quite frankly, God has been so good to us that our church has never batted an eye. God has always provided in wonderful ways. In our church, you'll notice that we don't even pass the plate. And I've prayed about this before, too. I'm not knocking churches that do, but... I do think that tithing is a personal thing, and I like to keep discretion, discreet, you know? And so I kind of leaned in that direction. Not saying I'll always be that way, but so, so you know, that's where it's some things I've prayed about. But let's look at Acts chapter 4, because the first point I want to make tonight is that uh, giving is important. And you see this in Acts chapter 4. I had some different study. That poor kid's got quite a little cough on him. Acts chapter 4. I had a little bit different study I was going to talk about when the church starts, right? It's an important topic to study. When does the body of Christ start? I believe it starts Acts chapter 2 because that's when the Holy Spirit comes. Different topic, but I want all you to think about tonight to simplify. Think of this Acts chapter 4 as a picture of an early church starting, a local assembly starting here, right? You see it in Acts chapter 2, you see it in Acts chapter 4. And in this local assembly, I want to show you the tone of this early church. Look at 4 and verse 31, real quick. 431 says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. In Acts 431, you see this Holy Spirit, right? The indwelling the Holy Spirit that comes at the day of Pentecost, which is why I believe the church starts in Acts chapter 2. Then you finally have what is what's prophesied or what's told in Colossians chapter 1. But suffice it to say, this early church, they're filled with the Holy Ghost and they all assemble together and the whole place is shaken. I use this as a proof text when I was talking about should we keep gathering during COVID, right? Everyone says, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. I said, no, we still need to. Uh, we shouldn't forsake the assembling. God works when people come together, when people pray together, when people sing together, when people open the Word of God together. Look at this early church. It's a powerful church. The church in Jerusalem. Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. In this early church, you know what they're given? Well, we're going to talk about percentages tonight. We will before we're done. But this early church, you know what they're given? 100%. And that's the same as our church. We take it right out of your check and go straight to the church's bank account. Just kidding. Just kidding. But 100%. How about that, right? They're just all in. They realize the treasures aren't, these things they have, they're not that important. Give them the work of the church. There's a lesson we can learn there, okay, beyond just the huge number. And 35, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, an example of a man selling something who brings the money forward. And in verse 35, you see that those funds are used for every man's need. Okay? This is back in the day when you had a good church, and you didn't need the government to bail people out. This is what America was based on upon. You never needed socialism, never needed government handouts because you had strong churches on every corner given to people as they had need. That's the system of a righteous nation. We've, we've drifted from that far, haven't we? It's actually related to our topic tonight. We've drifted from that because people stopped going to church, people stopped giving to church, and now we all look to, well, what do we need to help people out for? You're going to get a stimulus, right? Government's got you covered. It's broken down society in many, many ways. Look here, though, at these two individuals, a husband and wife team in chapter 5. Husband and wife. Think about that godly home series we're doing. And how, what kind of tone do you want to set in your home? You want to set a tone of a giving home. You don't want to raise misers, stingy people. 
Look at here at 5 verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, they, they brought part of it here. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. There's principles here. There's many. A big principle is that these people, Ananias and Sapphira, are plugging into this church in Jerusalem, and they're trying to act like they're all in like everybody else. Here it is. This guy did it, right? Joseph did it. We do it too. We're all in. We're given just like everybody else. We're on the same page. There's really quite a level of deceit here, though. They're not all in. They still think money is really, really important. They got to keep back apart because they got things to do, right? They got priorities. I'm sure they have priorities, but they're missing God's blessing. Different story. Big point is here, they're lying, they're living a lie in how they approach their Christian walk. They're not on the same page as this church. And look at five. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. God's not happy in this early church with these people who are lying because they want to hold more money. God's not happy. That's the very simple lesson we can learn. Look at 6. And, young, and the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. And Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. I don't think they're necessarily in this deep a trouble where they're losing their lives, I don't think they're in that deep trouble because they didn't give the 100%. I don't think that's why they're in big trouble. I think they're in big trouble because of the lies they're telling and because of this image they're portraying and then because of this conspiracy they have going. You know what's bad is one spouse living a lie. You know what's really bad is when the husband and wife team join in on this lie. It's a conspiracy. It ruins kids, right? You both, husband and wife, say, you know what? We're going to tell our kids that we are all in for God, but really we're not. You'll tell by the way we live, our priorities, our prayer lives, how we read our Bibles, how we plug into church. Live in a lie. Parents, you know what we want to do is uh, we want to be on the same page with truth. Amen. Never get to the point where you're going to be on the same page and share the lie about your life. That's a bad place to be. You both will dig each other into a deeper hole. Yeah, I don't really care about God, neither does she, but let's go along with this whole thing, this whole Christian thing, right? Let's play it out, see how it goes. God's not happy with that. He's disappointed that this wife comes forward with the same story three hours later. She falls down, and 11 says, And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as has heard these things. I think it's straightforward to say, or we can say, that giving is important. I think here we do see a stingy husband and wife who should have just been honest. This might have been the first Baptist church. <laughs> Look over, please, at chapter 5 and... No, let's not go there. Switch of plans. Let's look at instead, let's go over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians 16. Point one, giving is important. We're going to get to nitty gritty because I want us to find common ground of what we believe. A lot of folks coming out and I love it. Let's study the word of God together here. And of course, you know, if I preach something, this isn't necessarily a Bible study, it's more of a sermon, but afterwards, you ever want to talk to me about a topic, please just let me know. 
give me a call, shoot me a text, or, or grab me after the service. I'm willing to talk to anybody for iron to sharpen iron. But look here at 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2 I just read, they show that giving is to be done consistently, right? It should be done consistently. It's sad in our world that we value money so much that I know people, to the name, who will not go to church because they are so scared of this happening. They're so scared that plates can be passed under their nose, right? I told people, going to church, I just, I, like, young, like people who are not at all saved and just first time to church, I said, don't worry about it. It's, don't just come to church. Just come to church. But consistently is correct. We should give consistently. And it says there, it says, as God hath prospered him. This is going to be important as we know about what to give in our lives. As God hath prospered him means in proportion to what God has given him. Okay? As God prospers you, you give this much. If God prospers you much, then you give much. Okay? If God prospers you a different amount, then you give that different amount in proportion. Already seeing that tandem? It is a tandem. Okay? You see it right here in the words of Paul for our lesson in Sunday school. Sounds like a proportion as God hath prospered him. But the main point here in this chapter is giving is to be done consistently. You give, it's collected at the church, it's collected at the church regularly on Sundays. And I got a question for you. What if, what if no one ever gave? You see that in some of Paul's letters. This church never gave. But what if no one gave consistently? What if no one came to church consistently? You know, what the, you know what the truth would be? There wouldn't be near as many churches on corners as you see in America today. America was built by a giving people. It really was. You know, without consistency in attendance and in giving, churches do disappear. And no, I'm not asking for an offering at all. I'm just saying reality. Churches are not going to continue unless people get and start walking their faith out like people did of old. What if none gave? There would be no churches. Be no churches tomorrow. Please look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Giving is to be done consistently. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. It, it is a special topic, so I'm sorry if it's a topic that doesn't interest you at all, that you're already acing, but I think God wants us to cover it, even as we think about the home. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 tells us, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. We'll see in this chapter some keys that giving is to be done generously. We'll see in a second, giving is to be done freely and giving is to be done cheerfully. But here, the first point, generously. Look at 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. That verse 7 is important. There's many today who take this verse to mean as he purposeth in his heart, means that, frankly, it's whatever you feel compelled in your heart to give. Now, that's a theory out there, okay? I'm not bashing it all together yet, but that's a theory that, that you just give whatever God places on your heart. Whether He places nothing, you give nothing. Whether He places a whole 100%, you give 100%. Whatever God places on your heart. It's a theory. It also could mean that verse, as every man as he purposes on his heart, it very much could be talking about that verse before. When it's talking about sowing sparingly or sowing bountifully, what's God putting on your heart? What kind of giver are you? I tend to think that's what it's talking about. How much are you going? Are you going to be a bountiful giver or are you going to be a, a sparing giver? It says there, or of necessity. 
You know, that doesn't mean that giving isn't a necessity. Giving is a necessity. It just means that when you give, it, when you give, you shouldn't just give because you're supposed to. You should give because you want to. And that's part of the sermon tonight. You give what you want to. God loveth a cheerful giver. Don't get me wrong, before we're done, you're going to see that, uh, spoiler alert, I do think it's of necessity. You're supposed to. But what I want us to be in this church and to our children is that you give not because you feel that you have to, but because you want to. Because you don't value the dollar that much. It's not your treasure. Let's watch as this goes. Look at verse 8, please. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. There's no way you can read these writings and feel worried about affording tithing or giving, right? The question should be asked, you know, now, the question should be, how can you afford to give? You'll see here, the question should be, how can you afford to not give? Because when you give, it says in verse 8, you give and then you watch God meet your needs. Giving is a step of faith. Giving is a step of faith. It's one of those tests. There are many tests in life. One of the big ones is God tests where your treasure is. I, I've, you know, I, when I've lived, I have a testimony here, a personal testimony. My parents live paycheck to paycheck. I grew up with people living paycheck to paycheck. People in this church are living paycheck to paycheck. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God always finds a way. I have never seen a tither go hungry. I've never seen a giver struggle. I've never seen it. I don't know how it happens sometimes. I know people, there are people making very small amounts of money, but they give like that widow gave, and they're doing just fine. And then I know people in my work life, like my, my career life, you know, who I know they've got two incomes coming in. I know they've never given a dime to anybody, and they're struggling. I can't explain it, but God can. This passage explains it. God meets their needs. Just don't write me off as a televangelist. Please don't. This is what is, to me is hard. I don't want a cent from your wallet. I want us to know what the truth is, and then, then you decide what you do with your life, okay? Look at verse 9, please. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth, in, remaineth um, forever. You know why I have to preach this as a preacher? Because I'm supposed to preach the full counsel of God. And if I never preached on giving, then I'm not doing my job. Pray for me. Pastoring isn't all easy. Verse 9 here, you give and you'll be rewarded, it says. His righteousness remaineth forever. You give and you're rewarded in this life, and I believe you're even rewarded in the next life for being a giver. Reward, uh, righteousness remaineth forever. There's some big words here. I didn't even comment on in the verse before, having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. You give, God meets your needs, God allows you to do God's work. Look at verse 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. I didn't read it well, but there in verse 10, it's saying, you give to God, and he will give you the ability to give more. You give to God, and you'll see Him increasing your fruit. I heard a, a sister the other day um, talk about um, giving as if it is a fruit. It is. It's faith. Anytime as a Christian, and you want to show someone your, your fruits, you, you live by faith. Boy, giving is faith. Right? Giving is faith. You want to show someone that you have very little faith? Live like they live. Don't give. Look at verse 11, please. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. 11 and 12 tell us, Give, and you will help the work of the gospel going out. It's a real thing. 
I've already said it, but how would churches be built? How would churches exist? How would missionaries go out if not for the giver? God uses his principle of giving to do his work. And he doesn't need, he's not interested in how much you give. You know what he's interested in? The widow's might. He'll turn the widow's might into a powerful thing for the ministry. Giving is to be done generously, freely, and cheerfully. Let's look at some passages now and talk about who are we giving to. Look at Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3. You know, I agree with you that I would not want to give tithe, give offering to a crummy church that's probably just going to give the guy a $125,000 salary and they're going to keep just tickling people's ears. That would be hard, right? You want to find a church that's worth its salt to give to, right? But I want you to think bigger than that. There's a bigger picture than that. And the fact is, when we give, we're given to God. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9. Gives us this principle. 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance, with the first fruits of all thine increase. I've heard, you know, young people online talk about you know, tithing, giving. That was about giving your fruit and giving your animals and all that stuff. Well, they're right, because back then that was it. That was what you had. That was your value. You increase in this food, you give it out, right? Priests would live on it. Well, today, not many of us are planting big gardens. I'm sorry. My increase is, has to do with my paycheck. Probably yours, too, for the most part. But the idea of the first fruits you give to God still exists. We'll see some other places that say it. Look at 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. How does that happen? You've got to give the first fruits away to God, but then your barns are going to be bursting and overflowing. How does it happen? The same way you can afford to give today. You give, and God gives back. He always gives back more than you give. It's a step of faith. It's a step of faith. Do you trust God? Do you trust His Word enough? It's in the Bible enough for me to say it's real. Look at Malachi chapter 3. If you, we'll talk some nitty-gritty stuff here in just a second, but these are some basic concepts that giving is of God, and we giving is to God. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, please. Malachi 3, 8. And I sound like every con man in the world, but it is true in my heart this evening. I'm preaching this sermon not because I want the church to be blessed. I'm preaching this sermon because I want your life to be blessed. Amen. I say it honestly. Because the church is doing absolutely fine. God is blessed abundantly. Look at Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, Where and have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Yes, this is talking about the Israelites, the Jewish people, but God calls them on this. He says, You've been robbing me. And these things called tithes and offerings. I would have you note two things there. He says, You've been robbing me, haven't been given. Look, nine. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you, open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, and there shall be not enough room enough to receive it. I fumbled over the words, but you saw it. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. It's the same concept you saw in Proverbs. Same concept that you saw in first and second Corinthians. You give, God gives more. Okay? This is not just a Jewish principle. Okay? The giving concept is real. We are supposed to give to God. If we don't give to God, do you know what it is? It's not your discretion. It's called robbery. It's called robbery. I would go so far to say that giving with a joyful heart brings blessing. I would also go as far to say not giving, holding back, like Ananias and Sapphira, brings judgment, brings problems. I, that's what I see in Scripture. How about you? 
God doesn't bless people who disobey on anything. This is a real principle. Who are we giving to or not giving to? The name is God. I would have you note that that word tithe comes up here. Verse 8 says, in tithes and offerings. There's a lot of debate about this, and I'm not just preaching this for any one person. I hear this conversation more and more and more. And so let's drag out what this means. But a tithe does, you look up the definition of tithe, it means the tenth part of an increase. I looked that up inside that 1828 uh, Webster's. The tenth part of an increase. So 10%, right? Some say that tithing is just for Jews under the law. Let's look at this. Because I've already said, we've, already, we've established we can all agree that Christians are supposed to give, right? Everyone's supposed to give, right? And I've also said that God is upset if you don't give what you're supposed to give. And you're supposed to give in proportion to what you receive. So somewhere it should be kind of correlate, right? Got a big old fat paycheck, then somewhere giving should be pretty fat. Got a slim paycheck, maybe their giving's a little slim, and God holding you to that. But are there standards we can live by then? The word tithe here, some say that tithe is just for the Jews. Don't worry about it. Let's look at this, though. Please look at Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. There is a, a truth in Scripture I believe in, and that is when God talks about serious consequences, He usually gives pretty clear instructions. You know that? You know what the Bible says? Um, uh, it says, uh, marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The Bible says that if you, you know, sleep around before marriage or you have a partner who's not your real spouse, your first spouse, and you have those relations, he says that it brings judgment. So I have always said, well, if it's that severe, then it's probably well defined in Scripture. Right? If he's going to judge someone for being a whoremonger or judge someone for being an adulterer, he's probably going to spell it out. And yes, he does in Scripture. Spells it out for us, right? Gives us every little nuance. But then with tithing, I think it's kind of a similar thing. If God is going to bless us for giving and God is going to judge us for not giving what we should, I hope he spells it out somewhere for us. Right? And I think he does. He's a just God. I'm over here in Hebrews. I'm sorry. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7. I want to show you a verse here. Just, I'm winding, I am winding down. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like in the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. We don't need to look at the story of Melchizedek, different sermon. But I want to show you here that Abraham gives tithe to Melchizedek. Okay? This is way back in the Old Testament. This is Genesis chapter 14. Okay? This is way before the law. Way before the law there. Exodus 20 and thereabouts. Way before that. And look at verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. You see Abraham here, he's outside of Jewish law. Well outside of the law. But Abraham's principle was to give the tenth. You can read about this in Genesis chapter 14. It says the exact same thing. Okay? Now, as we look for how much to give in our lives, we're looking for a direction, right? I, I understand the rationale. Some people say, as God puts on my heart, I'm going to give. I understand what people with good hearts that understand the verses we've read, you, you, may, you may give a high percentage. and I'm not, I'm not saying you're not. But I'm saying as a rule for people who might not be in their Bibles as much as you, for a rule for new Christians who might have no faith whatsoever. We, we've had people saved in our church, and they come from a position of never having given a cent to a church their whole life. And now they see a plate passed around or a box in the back of the church. And what are they supposed to think? 
What well, is this like a five cent deal? Is this a quarter, quarter deal? You guys take change? I don't care. I, I don't want to beat them with the head, but I'm saying that people don't know. So what are they supposed to give? And meanwhile, you think this big God is going to hover over them saying that you're robbing me. Well, I think that God is going to tell this person how much to give. Abraham gave the tenth. Abraham's not alone. Look at Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. The, the fact that God spells things out in Scripture, to me, is love. You know that? It's God's love. The fact that He spells it out so we don't get it wrong. Some people think it's, 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 it's you see God's hate in that. Well, God's so particular in everything. No, He tells you what He wants. Nice and clear. What would be bad would be to have a father, right, a father on this earth who is always mad at you for doing the wrong thing but never tells you how to do the right thing. That, that would be a real pain. Our Heavenly Father is not that bad. That's a stupid way to say it. Our Heavenly Father is not that. He's righteous. He's holy. He's fair. He tells us what He wants. Look at Genesis chapter 28 and verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, this is Genesis chapter 28, verse 20, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. This is two generations after Abraham, okay? But Jacob, watch what he says. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob used those same words that were used with Abraham. The tenth, right? It very well could have been. I mean, Jacob could have said, I'll give you the, I'll give you 15%. I'll give you 5%. I'll give you 25%. But we see a pattern in Scripture where he gives a tenth, and not only that, he calls it the tenth, as if there is a universal rule. The book of Genesis is good for that. You want to think about big rules that God sets up for everything? You see that in the book of Genesis. Book of Genesis, you see the big rule that murder is absolutely wrong. Big rule, Cain and Abel, oh, got it wrong. We know still today murder is wrong. With Adam and Eve, you see he establishes marriage between one man and one woman. It's still true today. I think he also teaches us through the book of Genesis how much he wants us to give. Right? To him consistently. In proportion. What is the proportion? Here he says the tenth. And so, you know, we can, we can banter back and forth and talk about what does God want. And, the, you know, the New Testament, you know, Paul never says the tithe or Peter never mentions a percentage. But we're to rightly divide the word of truth. And as we said in Sunday school, we take here a little, there a little. So that's what I've done tonight. We saw what Paul said, right? And now we see what these men say. And now I want to say, how are you going to live your life? What rule are you going to live by? So you don't rob God. For me, I'll tie. I just see it in Scripture. The tenth, the tenth. Look what Jesus says about tithing. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Well, how can we afford it? question is, how can we afford not to? Amen. How can we afford not to give our lives to the Lord? Our energy, our time, the days of our youth. And we don't think God can repay. I think this whole little topic about giving is kind of a snapshot of our whole lives. Look at Luke chapter 11, verse 42, please. If, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to say one other thing. You know how big churches operate successfully and how they build new buildings? They've got a packet full of 1,000 plus people giving as God lays on their heart here and there. And to build such a mighty congregation, you just have to do a lot of ear tickling. And as our brother was talking about, you've got to have a mighty nice concert. You've got to please the flesh, right? Make sure it's an entertainment scene, not really a conviction scene. But you do all that work, so then you have resources to build bigger and bigger. Or you know what God can use? He can use five Christians giving faithfully to support His work. And they will never miss a payment. 
They will always be fed. Missionaries will be supported. Buildings will go up. Kids will have Sunday school from just five people giving. As they should. God is good. He knows how to do his work. Luke eleven forty two 42 tells us, but woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye tithe, mint, and rule, and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Jesus is always fighting with the Pharisees, and he always tells them things they shouldn't do, right? You, keep, you got this silly rule about washing your hands. You got this silly rule about um, what do you pray on. Here he says, he doesn't say that their tithing is a silly rule. He doesn't say it's done away with. Watch him. He says, these ought ye to ha have done. Right? The, the big point he's making, I understand. The big point is here, Pharisees, you ought to have judgment. Right? Don't pass over judgment in the love of God. But his words are uh, important. You still should do the tithing, but you should also do this other thing. Understand? So if anybody asks you, what did Christ say about tithing? Uh, Christ was pro-tithing. And then you can get into the whole nuance of, well, he just said it to the Pharisees. Well, with the Pharisees, he's pointing all of them towards church doctrine. He points them all towards the church, the church age. Telling them what to keep from the law, what to take from the law. Okay. Jesus said to tithe. Look at Luke chapter 21. We only have two spots to go and we're done. Thank you for your patience. I understand we've got some coughs out there tonight. Luke 21, and I, I wanted to show this because it's, it's, it speaks volumes what Christ thought about giving, 21.1. And he looked up, Luke 21.1, he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. Then he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Okay. These rich men, they might have been giving what God placed on their heart, and they, they might have been hefty sums. It sounds like they were. This little widow gives two mites. Three, and he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. This woman is an inspiration. This woman is a woman of faith. This woman is someone we want to aspire to be. And Jesus gives us the answer. Jesus doesn't care about the amount. Jesus cares about the percentage. He sees faith in the percentage, right? I know people. I've seen people, and I love people to visit, and they'll, they'll swing by for one service. I'll never see them again. But I, they're generous. They'll come, they'll drop a fat check in the box or something, and... Uh, thank you, it's wonderful. We'll use it for God's glory. Praise the Lord. But in God's eyes from heaven, he's looking down and he, think, he thinks they're that rich person. You've got tons, okay? You, you gave nothing compared to faithful Christians who are giving consistently. They're giving with a generous heart. They're giving not knowing how they're going to get by the next week. That's who I'm really going to bless. It's really the truth. This is how Christ views our giving. Again, there's 100%. <laughs> Look at Luke chapter 12 and we'll finish out. We'll close down. Luke chapter 12. I think we're to give and I think God gives us the percentage. And I said the whole thing about tithes and offerings for a reason because, you know, I think God does for us is God with tithe, He gives us that standard. Okay? It's a standard and, you know, you can meet it. It's great. You're doing your job. You're not robbing God, right? Okay? But then in the offering sense, the tithes and offering, offering, that's where you're giving abundantly, right? And you're receiving abundantly. That's how I see it. Tithes and offerings. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Let's start again. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. The, the bigger point I want us to think about as we close is why do people not tithe? Why do people not give consistently? I think there are doctrinal things online. You know what I think the doctrinal things are? Excuses. People are making excuses not to give consistently, not to tithe. 
That's what it comes down to, I believe. Not to everybody. I know that people in this room probably have different opinions. So God knows your heart. But as a general rule, why people do not tithe is because they have a lack of faith and because their treasures are on this earth. That's why people don't give. And the doctrine is just an excuse. Smoke and mirrors. Well, we're not really sure. Not really sure. <laughs> Look at Luke chapter 16. It doesn't bode well for your faith. It doesn't say much about you. 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. You know what you see in this Luke chapter 12? You see the picture of the American man, the American woman. In America, our ground has brought forth plentifully, has it not? Even the lower people, lower standards of living, they're still well fed. They're doing fine compared to standards of old. They are, <laughs> their ground brings forth plentifully. In 17, this is America. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? We're so well off, our, we're, our, we fill our days with figuring out how to get more stuff, where we're going to put new stuff. We fill our days with all these treasures. We really do. 18, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. You know, that's an, that's an unending thing. My wife and I and our family on Saturday night, we did, last night we walked out um, up to the park and back like we do many times. And I walked past everybody's house. And I actually was a little bit sad inside that you see the exact same thing. These people, we live in a pretty nice neighborhood as you walk up towards the park there. You see these people have got a camper. I'm not preaching against campers. I like them, okay? This person's got a camper. This person's got a motorcycle, okay? This person's got this truck. This person's got this car. And you walk to the next house. And they've got the motorcycle and they've got the, they got the truck. Okay, they're working on the camper. You walk to the next place. The person's got the camper. They've got the truck. They're working on the motorcycle. They're all just collecting things at different stages, right? They've all got the same pieces, all the same treasures. But you know that's consumed their whole life. I know it. I know people who have spent their whole life trying to get that camper, and I like campers, but that's it. Get more stuff. Get finally get the motorcycle. Get the bigger truck. They spend their whole life building bigger, building bigger, building bigger. It says in verse 18, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. 19, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. We talked about that this morning, that that cup, we think it's just, it's full for us. In these things that we have, it's not. There ain't going to be any eating or drinking. Watch, 20. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things, though whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? The fact of the matter is, wealthy Americans and across the world, we collect all these things only to die and take absolutely none of them with us. And having spent all of our days toiling for those things, they are our treasures. That's the world's way. It's damning people to hell. But inside good churches, we are still hung up on how important things are and money is. You see it every day. You see it every day. People, I know people who, can't, who won't come to our church because they know that I'm going to want them to attend faithfully. And they've got a job that's going to pull them out on Sundays here and here and here and here. And they know I'm going to challenge them to put God first. Okay? So they don't come. Oh, what a terrible choice. I know people who don't come to church because they're afraid of that, that plate being passed around. Oh, what a terrible choice. People are scared, but Christians ought not to be scared of this. Our life does not consist in the abundance of things which we have. Not our life. 21 says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know what that says in 21? Jesus gives us a principle here that I don't think is just for the non-believer. There in 12, 21, he says the ending is sad for anybody who's not rich toward God. For anybody who's investing their life, their time, their energy into things. In our homes, this ought not be us. Our homes should not look like 16 to 21. With our children dying, having spent their whole life trying to chase what their dad tried to chase who his grandfather tried to chase, right? 
The spiral of the dollar bleeds into American culture in a terrible way. You're standing. You read the Proverbs. It talks about money as you put into a bag with holes. That's what you're doing. You read the Proverbs. It talks about money gets wings and it flies away. But dads, what's our goal? We want to be wealthy and tell you what, we want to raise children who know how to make money. Right? Be successful like their dad. It should not even hold a candle to having a kid who's rich with God. I said it before, but you know what I want? I want my kids, I want a bunch of poor kids when they get older. I want a bunch of poor kids who are serving the Lord with all their hearts. I don't care. If I, I probably won't because I want them serving God. If I don't see a lawyer, a doctor, a dentist, a whatever, I do not care. I want to see preachers. I want to see teachers. I want to see deacons. I want to see pastor's wives. I want to see missionaries. I want to see church workers. I want to see church members. And our kids aren't going to do that if they see us as business people. They're not going to do that. They see us as having treasures on this earth. They're going to say, that's what dad thought was important. That's what mom thought was important. The stuff. No, we'll lose our kids. We sure will. Our life is shown here in verse 22 down. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for your body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. And God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? And if ye then be not able to do that thing, which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the, This is all talking about how God takes care of us when we rest in Him. 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The lilies do just fine. They don't toil. They don't spin. But in our lives today, we toil all we can to get by. We spin around in circles all we can just to make it by. When all we really need to do is give our lives to the Lord. 28, if then God so clothe the, clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow cast in the oven, how much more will you, he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye that which, which shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. We have this thing called God. And the world doesn't have it. But we do this thing called we live like the world, even though we have God. We have the richest father known to man. Owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He gives you cattle in your life and expects you to give up 10% of it. And we struggle. Can we afford to do this? Can our God handle it? Are we going to make it by? I, I submit to you today, you could give 100% like the widow's might and you'd be just fine. I don't have that kind of faith. I should. I don't. But I, th I can tell you today, you'll be just fine. Give 100% like they did in, the, in Acts chapter 4. I believe you'd be just fine. I know I'm going to give a testimony. We have a man in our church who I'm not going to name his name, but he gives incredibly. In fact, he probably, this church we stand in, it's a lot of him. He doesn't give 10%. He doesn't give 20%. He doesn't give 30%. He doesn't give 40%. I don't know what this man gives, but he gives a well and above. And he has more faith than I have. And you know what I see in his life? God blessing him. Amen. I never told him to do it. I'm not some pastor saying, you need to give more. I don't. He did it on accord. Always have. Always has. Don't want him to get a big head. But he's doing just fine. God's taking care of him. He lived out the Bible. Lived his faith. I think we could have a church full of those people. I think we'd all be blessed. It says in verse 31, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's a promise in Scripture. Yes, you can afford to tithe. 32, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The motorcycle, the car, the truck, the dollars, they all pass away. 
can't take them with you. But we spend our lives fixated on these things. The truth is, for us, we waste our lives on this. But for the world, they drop into hell. These rich men that we know, men and women, they absolutely drop into hell because they've spent time seeking the dollar, not seeking the Savior. How can we help them understand that the Savior and their eternal soul is so much more important? Well, we can tell them and we can show them. Show them with how we treat dollars. That's the lesson. I pray God uses it for His honor and glory. It's a heart condition though, isn't it? Giving takes faith, I'll tell you. Giving takes faith. And, and, and if, you, if you don't know the Lord, you know, I don't know if you'll ever quite get it if you're not saved. If you're not saved, I don't know if you ever understand that kind of faith because I think you're struggling with that first faith. That first faith being you need to trust Christ as your Savior. Rest in Him as your Savior. We said it this morning, let me quote it again, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To close, I ask you, do you have faith to trust Christ your Savior and nothing else? If your salvation testimony is one of having trusted your faith plus what you're doing, if your salvation testimony is one of, you know, I, I profess and I'm trying, I'm trying my best to get there. Friend, I love you. I love your heart. But that means you don't know the Lord because there ain't no trying to get there. There ain't no process. Call upon the Lord in complete faith and He will save your soul. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd use this message tonight for your honor and glory. Lord, I get a lot of things wrong, I know. But I don't think I'm wrong on this concept of giving, Lord, and tithing for that matter. Lord, I don't think I'm wrong at all in the concept of faith, living by faith. Let us live by faith by how we give. Let us uh, live by faith, Lord, in sharing the gospel with others. Lord, if someone here tonight doesn't know the Savior, I didn't touch on the gospel story much, Lord, but I trust that you'd compel their hearts, Lord. You'd prick their hearts and they would believe the gospel so that they don't have a moment where they die and they realize their whole life has been for naught, like that rich man. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.